as we've already gathered, today is Trinity Sunday. Sigh. It's the kind of Sunday which can test a poor ordinance to the limits. How on earth can I explain the doctrine of the Trinity to you in eight minutes? I've had some help over time, though. About two weeks ago, Nick, our vicar, kindly reminded those of us who were at the Tuesday Bible study group that, that a lot of Christian theology is what we call apophatic, meaning we never quite know what to say about who and what God is. After all, he is transcendent, outside of creation, completely beyond our understanding. But we can list several things that he isn't. We can, for example, say with confidence that he is not created or that he is not evil. But the Trinity seems to be making a positive statement about God. He is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. Exactly how God is three persons, but one God, however, is an apophatic mystery. But what I'll propose to you today is that the Trinity gives us a very practical lens through which to read the Bible. It not only reveals who God is, but makes sense of the vast anthology of writings that we call the Bible. In our reading from Isaiah this morning, the prophet tells us, us of how he saw a glorious vision of the throne room of heaven. He actually says he saw the Lord high and lofty. But in apophatic style, he doesn't say anything more than this, but goes on to describe the other creatures and heavenly movements. The doctrine of the Trinity gives us some tips on how to read this passage. Old Testament scholars have been fascinated by the verse which says, the hem of the Lord's robe filled the temple. It's important to note here that there are two different places in this scene. There's the Lord sitting on his throne in heaven, and then the temple, presumably the actual temple in Jerusalem. What connects the heavenly throne room and the temple is this mysterious robe which comes from God and fills the temple. This kind of makes sense according to the ancient Hebrew religion. The Hebrews actually believed that God dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem being the place that connected heaven and earth, just as God's robe here connects the throne room of heaven and the temple in Jerusalem. Let's fast forward to Christianity. And this connecting robe takes on a special significance. As Christians, we believe that the Son of God, one of the three persons of the Trinity, became incarnate in Jesus Christ so that God could be revealed to humanity and adopt the human condition. Jesus replaced the temple where God dwelt through his becoming human and then dwelling in the church through the other persons of person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, whom we celebrated last Sunday. It is Christ, the Son of God, whose divine work connects physical creation with the divine kingdom of God. Hopefully you can see the connection with the Isaiah passage. As Jesus says in our gospel reading, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Is this robe that Isaiah saw an early prophecy of the incarnation? of the Son of God becoming human in Christ Jesus. Does this tell us something about how the doctrine of the Trinity works? Perhaps. Let's go on to verse 3 of Isaiah 6. This gives us what we commonly call the Sanctus. The angels praise God by calling out, Holy, Holy, Holy. In Biblical Hebrew, if you say something three times, it, it implies massive emphasis. For example, if you say shalom, which is hello or peace, once, you're being polite to somebody. If you say shalom twice, it probably means you're really very good friends with somebody. But if you say shalom three times, well, you're probably head over heels in love. The seraphim cry out, holy, 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 expressing the absolute perfect, emphatic holiness of God. Also, the fact that holy is said three times 
should make our ears prick up as Christians. Also, note Isaiah's words upon seeing the glory of God. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. This overwhelming sense of feeling absolutely gutted is very common when humans come into contact with God in scripture. Isaiah recognises his need to be washed of his sins and purified by God. In this instance, a seraph flies to Isaiah and cleanses his lips with a strange coal. But let's compare this to Jesus and Nicodemus' conversation in our gospel reading. Nicodemus asked Jesus how he can perform the signs he had, he had done without the presence of God. I think Nicodemus was grasping at, or just beginning to see if even dimly, that he was speaking to a person of the Trinity, the Son of God himself. Jesus responds by saying that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Here, the reference is, of course, to baptism especially when he re references water and the spirit. There's a connection here with being born again and the cleansing that Isaiah required. Yes, the symbols are different, but the same reality of fallen humanity is expressed. And physical signs are used to signify God's ability to reverse humanity's fallen state. So far. We have shown that our readings point to the Trinity in several ways. The Trinity isn't just a doctrine which has no application or relevance to us, as I think we can sometimes assume. Let's listen to that beautiful verse from our gospel again, which I think screams out the Trinity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. In revealing himself as Trinity, God simultaneously reveals our own salvation. Indeed, it seems like Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus sums up much of God's plan for our salvation, including Jesus being lifted up on the cross for us. Yes, the Trinity is an apophatic mystery that we can never quite understand, as we can never really understand God. But it is a mystery which opens our eyes to a God that cares about his creation deeply, drops the hem of his robe into our world, and ultimately opens the gate of heaven, heaven to us, by sending his son to bring us back to life. Amen.